Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Amashri him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. <coughs> oh, that's affecting me. I drank something earlier. Um, <clears throat> okay, now if uh, we sent the papers to you, and I am going to show it on the screen because last time uh, everybody wanted to follow it on the screen, so I'm going to bring up the screen, and the document is there, and I'll fill in the comments as we go along. Okay. So now tonight we're going to be doing the uh, looking more closely at the section on protecting relationships first. There are basically six types of relationships to protect and the six directions. Now this directions, I will preface this by saying that in uh, India and it was a traditional thing to get up in the morning and basically say precepts and uh, the, the morning offering verses that, that, that someone would do in their home. And then they would pay tribute to the six directions and that's what we're going to be talking about. So it'll talk a little bit about this. So we begin our lives, we are children brought up at home and the East represents children and parents. As youth, the next stage of our life is spent in school and the South represents students and teachers. As grown-ups, we have our social lives and the North represents husbands and wives. And then as breadwinners, we have our businesses and work. The Nader going down into the earth represents the employers and employees. And then as we mature in our lives, we seek higher goals, spiritual goals. And the Zenith represents lay persons and the spiritual teacher or spiritual guide advising you. And the Buddha graphically and very nicely depicted the various sets of relationships in the society as the six directions that should be protected. Each direction represents a different social relationship where each party has reciprocal responsibilities towards each other. And using the further symbolism of the four main uh, cardinal directions, each one signifies a different stage that everyone goes through in life from a child to an adult. In addition, the nadir, that's the part that's down in the earth or the downward direction represents the down to earth reality of earning a living and the zenith or the upward direction that represents the higher spiritual life. So they were paying tribute to the couples of the two pieces of each one of these directions that we're gonna go into now. In Buddhism, relationships should be reciprocal and not one-sided. A spirit of generosity and considerate behavior are necessary. And thus each person helping and being considerate to the others Everyone in turn benefits from this positive conduct. That was the principle of this. In this way, all the relationships in society are protected and the well being of the community is assured. So everything was about the balance of the community. So, first we go to the East, protecting, um, protecting the East. I need to make sure I have access to something here. Okay. Okay. Protecting the East, children and parents. We start with them. 
how children treat their parents by supporting their parents when necessary. Now, what that means is this is the most basic duty of children towards their parents to show gratitude for all of the difficulties and expenses to bring them up. They must provide for them in old age. And according to the Buddha, the only way that we can continue to repay our parents is to teach and to get them to participate in the Dhamma and practice too. By helping them in their business, at work, or in any other appropriate ways, by keeping the family together, by being worthy of their inheritance. What does that mean? This would mean good behavior, loyalty, and the children doing the best that they can for the sake of their parents who have worked so hard to provide them with their inheritance, whether it is large or small makes no difference. And by doing charitable acts in memory of departed parents and relatives. Now how parents should treat their children, this is the reciprocal part, by restraining their children from doing wrong by encouraging them to do what is right. The parents are the first teachers that their children have and they should actively guide them to not only avoid doing bad deeds, but also they should encourage them to do good deeds. And there is no better way for parents to do this than by being good examples and role models for their own children. By having them trained in a profession. Well, in the modern context, what this means is this duty means that the parents should provide their children with at least a basic education. And for Buddhist uh, parents, this should include some education in the Dhamma too. Nowadays, many Buddhist parents overlook or ignore this responsibility. And usually it's because they themselves do not have much knowledge in this area. However, all Buddhist parents should not neglect this crucial duty of setting their children as early as possible on the right path. And their meaning in Buddhism is basically what operates the best for the person's life to be the happiest and most balanced and calm life, okay? and the community. That's what it means when it says right path. It isn't saying this is right, everything else is wrong. It's not like that. When it says right path, we have to remember that's what it means, that it operates well for them and for the community and for people around them, and it, it, it's not harming them or anyone else. By helping and giving them advice in the choice of a suitable marriage at a proper time, by handing over their inheritance at a proper time as well. Now that has a practical point, uh, very serious implications, especially today. Many people are not adequately prepared for death and leave ambiguous wills, or maybe they don't leave wills at all. And this frequently results in the surviving family members fighting with each other and a lot of hatred going on and animosity over the estate of the deceased person. And parents should try to allocate as much of the inheritance as they can to their children while they are still alive to prevent such disputes from arising and ensure a smooth transition and handing over. This is the guidance that was given by the Buddha. So when children and parents treat each other in these ways, the East is protected and the family made peaceful and secure. The next direction is the South. Protecting the South has to do with students and guides or teachers. How students should treat their teachers. By showing their teachers proper respect, by attending to their needs, by personal service to them, by being eager to learn, by paying careful attention when they're being taught, and how teachers should be treating their students, by training their students to develop self-discipline 
by teaching them so that they understand the lessons well, by giving them a well-balanced education, and by introducing them to friends and colleagues. And that one is interesting because this would mean that teachers should help their students by putting them in touch with their own connections by doing so the students will get to know the right people and will further move further on in their studies and when they're looking for jobs it will help them to be able to consult these people and the buddha more than 2500 years ago already saw the importance of what this is and it's social networking and I want to tell you that I'm really lucky because I ended up with Bonte uh, Bibala Ramsey as a teacher because when I was attending him for a number of years, you know, helping with traveling all over the country to different temples and talking to people, he made a point of introducing me to the monks where he knew the abbots at various temples. I got to sit and listen to many, many discussions and connect with these people so that I could, you know, talk to them later on when I started teaching. And it was a real blessing to have an actual teacher that was willing to do that. He really took it as a responsibility to me as someone that was being trained. By helping to ensure their safety and their well being, this is also the teachers should treat the students to make sure that they are safe and the well being have well being in the locations where they're being taught. The other thing that we have in the suttas is the Chanki Sutta, number 95, and the 12 points of the Chanki Sutta. I always like to teach that when there's an extra day or something in a retreat because people get a look at what it's like uh, for the student to make the highest grades and be the successful student in anything that you do in life. This is not just in the meditation. You can look at it from that angle, but one student who was the head of an engineering department at the University of Southern Missouri, he had to be the the professor who was taking the incoming orientation for freshmen and he took this the 12 points and presented it in a framework in reference to students coming into a university who were going to study with professors and try to show what the university would like the students to do and this also echoed over to the to the teachers themselves how uh, the students should be working with the teacher student relationship and it went very very well so this stuff is flexible that's what's interesting it's flexible into using in the universities and colleges so when students and teachers treat each other in this way the south is protected and the places of learning are made peaceful and secure we then go to protecting the west and this is the husbands and wives now, by treating, uh, how should the husband treat his wife? By treating her with courtesy and by showing her respect. In a culture where males were very dominant and the females usually treated as second-class citizens or even worse in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha advocated a change in the mindset and the attitudes towards women, promoted equality between the partners, and it was good advice then, as it is now, that husbands should always treat their wives with courtesy and respect and maintain a loving and enduring relationship. That's great. Okay, by being faithful to her and by sharing authority of the household with her and by providing her with jewelry and gifts. Now that's an interesting point because in ancient India, uh, before there were any banks, people usually put their savings and their wealth into jewelry and the jewelry was worn on the person and was often the only form of savings that a wife had if her husband were to pass away. 
Nowadays, this would mean the husbands should have sufficient insurance coverage for their wives and children in case of any unexpected serious illness or death. Par apart from this kind of practical reason, all wives would enjoy some jewelry and gifts from their husbands from time to time. And that really doesn't change. I think the ladies still feel that way. <laughs> How a wife should be treating her husband by properly organizing the household, by being hospitable to in-laws when they visit and treating household workers very well. Now household workers include domestic maids and how significant this advice is nowadays because we can see so many housewives being hauled into court for ill treating of their maids that are resulting in shame and difficulties for their families. And this kind of thing isn't worthwhile to anyone in the community or the home. So treating them fairly is really important by being faithful to him, by helping to preserve the family wealth. The wives have a duty toward their husbands not to overspend or waste hard-earned money they should be spending things wisely and help to save whenever possible so they can preserve the family's wealth. Again, this is another example of the Buddha's practical and timeless advice that's relevant in his time, but it's also relevant again in our time. By being skillful and diligent in her duties. And when husbands and wives treat each other in this way, the West is protected and uh, households make made peaceful and secure. So how one should treat friends and associates, that's the next one. How should we should treat friends and associates? By being generous and willing to share, by speaking with kind words, by being helpful, by being impartial and Im unbiased, by being sincere and honest. And how should friends and associates treat each other? By taking care of each other when they are vulnerable, by protecting their property when they are vulnerable, by being a refuge in times of fear or danger, by not abandoning them in times of need, by respecting and showing consideration for their family. When friends and associates treat each other in this way, the North is protected and society is made peaceful and secure. So these two sections here seem to have missed that heading, but how one should treat their friends and associates is the beginning of the North direction, okay? That's the North direction. The next one is protecting the nadir going down into the earth with employers and employees. How employers should treat their employees? By assigning their employees work according to their abilities, by paying them adequately for their work, by looking after their medical needs, by giving them special treats and this may be taken nowadays to mean that employers should share in the profits and success by giving out rewards and bonuses and competitions for employee loyalty as an incentive for them to continue their hard work for long-term good for their employers. And by allowing them leave and holidays, and this is referring to, it's truly really amazing that the Buddha to have included three, these points here as they were made more than 2,500 years ago when slavery was common, workers were exploited, and there were no such things as minimum wages or basic working conditions. Only in the last century did trade unions obtain such rights for workers. So we can see that a lot of things he's talking about were applicable then and applicable now. He was way ahead of his time. How the employees should treat their employers by arriving early to work, by staying late 
when it's necessary. By taking only what is given, by doing their job well, by upholding and spreading the good reputation of their employer and protecting the zenith, which is up to the heavens or the firmament, the guide and lay followers. This is about them. How lay followers should treat their spiritual teachers. Again, we look at the Chanki Sutta in reference to this. By kind actions, by kind speech, by kind thoughts. And this is referring to, it should be taken to mean kind actions, speech, and thoughts. It should be practiced only towards the spiritual teachers. And by performing these wholesome deeds towards all beings, the lay followers are in fact really repaying their teachers' efforts to uh, putting what has been learned into practice for their own benefit and for others too. Okay. By keeping the house open to them and by providing with material needs. This may be taken to mean that the lay followers should extend their support to all virtuous spiritual teachers in general and not have excessive devotion towards just one particular spiritual teacher or monk. If the teacher is upright and imparts good teachings, then all is well. However, the danger of being led astray arises if such partiality blinds one to improper or inaccurate teachings. And also, if anything were to happen to the favorite teacher or the monks, then the lay follower with such undue devotion may fall away from valuable and necessary spiritual guidance. Okay. How spiritual teachers should treat their lay followers by restraining them from doing wrong, by encouraging them to do what is right, by showing them compassion, by teaching them what they do not know, by clarifying what has been taught, by showing them the way and guiding them in spiritual practice. In the Buddhist context, this means that the practice of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity and meditation and other higher spiritual teachings and practices is what's being referred to. And when spiritual teachers and lay followers treat each other in this way, the zenith is protected and spiritual places are made peaceful and they're made secure. So the summary of this is parents are the east and the teachers are the south. The spouses are the West, the friends and associates are the North, the workers and employees are the Nader, the spiritual teachers are the Zenith. These are the directions to be honored by one who would be fit to lead a good life. So now I included for you all these notes that I went over with you and left space for you. Does anybody have any questions about this section before we go on to this other section? Does anybody have any questions about these, uh, the, the, the directions? Mm -mm, I, I don't know why you don't want me to do that. <laughs> this is really funny. I can't get to you. Mm. Mm. Okay.
Okay. Does anybody else have anybody have any questions in this section? I'm sorry, I got bumped off. <laughs> Our internet is leaves a lot to be desired right now. <laughs> Can I ask one? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, suppose uh, uh, we know the Sigalavatta Sutta, right? Yeah. And we are observing all the directions what we are uh, told by Buddha to follow. And if uh, from the other side, the reciprocal side, it is not happening. So what we have to do at that time or what will be uh, means exactly the merits uh, 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 to our deed or their deed? And I want to get through that question. Hello. Sister. Hello. I think sister has lost the net connection. I did no no no. Uh, it is uh, uh, the internet is the uh, problem. Yeah yeah net connection yeah. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, I think she will log back once again. I'm just. Okay. So we had a question that came up. Bunty? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The question is uh, according to Sigolavadda uh, Sutta, uh, uh -huh. we are according to the Sutta, we are observing all the directions as said by the venerable buddha right uh, this is uh, from our side but the reciprocal side if it is not observing so what are the um, merits or what is the uh, thing going to happen at that time if we, well if you're to, i mean i don't practice this every day I have this in my mind, the directions, but it's not prevalent that much in India anymore. It used to be very prevalent in every village. People would come out and do this in the morning. This is way back and it's not there systematically anymore. And um, I'm not sure in the Hindu tradition, I'm not sure how it works with the directions, but I bet you there's something there with the directions also left over from that period of time. Um, these are the things that you pay attention to. The Sigalavata isn't asking, saying to you, you have to do this practice. One of the things about, about Buddhism is people misunderstand that, uh, for instance, when you become a Sotapanna, the statement of, um, the statement is that you don't have any doubt anymore that there is that the Buddha found something significant and that there was a practice that op can open up your mind when that's one of the things. The second one um, had to do with um, my, my mind is blocked today. I had the second shot and I'm not feeling great. <laughs> okay, but uh, anyway, the uh, the doubt you don't have any doubt anymore and you you complete you understand anatta the anatta teaching it doesn't mean that you always live in a selfless perspective that you only that you live in a an impersonal perspective all the time it means that you really understand it okay bhanti what was the second one i'm doing a blank here it was uh, I am oh, right. Okay, that's what it writes in rituals. It's a statement that you understand once this happens to you once the first time you experience Nibbana. And this is one of the misconceptions that there's only one Nibbana and we're only going to that super mundane Nibbana and that's the only Nibbana that exists. And it's not quite like that. Once you get into the training, uh, in the text, and you understand that I was telling them last week, I stumbled on a sutta where the statement was he had his first experience with Nibbana. And I thought, oh, that's divine. Why didn't I write it down on a three by five card? <laughs> don't ask me why, because <laughs> I come to these things sometimes and I don't know, 
put them in the back of my book and mark them. And I forgot to do it, but it was right in the near the end of the sutta, the remark between the Buddha and these other monks, he had his first experience in Nibbana. And I thought that's really neat because in our school, we look at this and we say that you, if you were an arahat with fruition, which is the highest level, you would have experienced Nibbana eight times. You see, it's one for each of the attainments. There's four attainments and there's, and then there's four fruitions, four attainments and four fruitions. And each time you experience it, it goes Sotapana, Sotapana and fruition, Sakadagami, Sakadagami and fruition, um, you know, Anagami, Anagami and fruition, Arahat and Arahat and fruition. And it's discussed in the suttas. And today there's all kinds of other statements about that. Oh, that's not real. You only have this one Nibbana and that's all there is. is that's not true, you see. So we go back into the sutta's text. So you're saying, what would happen if I didn't do that? Well, you're not, you, it's giving you all the information and it's up to you what you do with it. Remember, this is advice for the lay people. This is not God and God said you have to do this or you're going straight to, you know, that place down there. <laughs> okay. You know, it isn't like that in Buddhism. It's not. And so these, he's giving you, I like the Buddha. Why do I like the Buddha? This old 50 year Christian that was a Christian for half a century. Why do I like it? I like it because I see the Buddha had only one occupation in his lifetime. And that was a master and meditation teacher. And when he woke up, what did he decide to do? When he started teaching, you tell me, what did he teach? He was the son of a king and he'd been trained in just about everything and had the best education. But what did he decide to teach? He taught, made the decision to teach you how he did this so that you can repeat it. And that was his dedication for 40 years or how 45 or 40 years. While he's teaching that whole time, he's teaching one subject and it's basically the meditation subject and all things that happen to him across that time when he's teaching uh, all come back to the fact that the meditation was a solution through the guidance of the Brahma Viharas. It seems like that was what the solution for the conflicts in the villages, in the communities, in the states and countries and things like that too. And so all his advice stems from that. But this thing about rites and rituals, when you're Sotapanna, you uh, lose all doubt and you know that right, here's the statement, rites and rituals will not take you to Nibbana. You know that when you go through the first time, you know that, that it, no rites and rituals can take you to where you just went and had that experience the first time, okay? But people have turned that into, we are not allowed as Buddhists to celebrate any rites and rituals anymore. Uh, see, this is what people do today. They extreme this way, extreme that way. They don't really look at what was said. And what is said here is rites and rituals will never take you to Nibbana. That's what the statement was. And you know it once you have experienced that. So, the reason I'm emphasizing this to you is that he gives you a set of advice in this sutta, and then he goes a little bit further in the next part that we have to go through. The next part, it, it goes through the other, um, the other piece, which is the um, qualities for the successful individuals. And when you go through that, then you ask me another question at the end, okay? Ask me another question when we go through this one. This one's much shorter than with a long section doing all six of the directions like that. But that's how they organize things. So you could remember the information. You know, I hung out a lot uh, with the Chinese community in Malaysia and they're really great. They're very supportive and they're very organized and they have wonderful ways of teaching. And I lived in Taiwan when I was young, um, you know, when I was 19, 20 and 21, I was living in Taiwan and um, I got to visit elementary schools to see how they were teaching children. And um, it was it was really exciting to me because I had read a lot about 
the Chinese methods of teaching kids and stuff. And one of the things they do is when I'm, when I'm teaching you, I will say it to you and you will hear it and you will see me write it on the board. And then you will write it. So you see it, you hear it, and you write it down, and then I get you to say it. And then they say, you know it. That's how they teach people. So this is a methodical thing that we see today in uh, brain research about learning a new habit, letting an old habit go and training the brain to respond in a particular way. And here we come back to neural plasticity and our brain is flexible and each one of those neural pathways in our brain is one of our habits. And if it's a bad habit and you wanna change it, you can just dry it out and it'll fall off and you start a new little footpath in there instead of a, a big you know, sidewalk or a road that you had. And the old one is gonna just go away if what? If you don't pay attention to it anymore and you do the new one, the counterpiece, then you're feeding this construction of a new neural pathway in your brain and you're training yourself to respond instead of just reacting to everything. See? So I'm going all over the place because that's how I usually answer questions in case you're new. <laughs> I try to hook it into the things that you're going to understand. And, and the thing is that he gives us advice. Whereas when I was in church, they gave me commandments. And the, and the thing was, if you didn't follow them, you, you were weeping before you went to sleep at night, worried about hell, and you were going to end up there and just burn for all eternity if you didn't go to you know, confession and you didn't do these things exactly the way you're being told. And the priest... I love the priests and I loved the ministers, but when I was in high school, it was a clear thing to most of us that the priest is the one who has the red phone in the front of the church. And he's the only one that gets to talk to God. We don't get to talk to God. We just get told what to do. And I didn't like that. And it wasn't working out because I wasn't getting information about how things actually happen that go wrong in life. and. I needed to know how things break and how things work. And if you tell me how it, that happens, I'm not scared anymore, really. And so, you know, you can come fire a gun outside. I'm not going to jump. I'm just going to say, oh, he fired, somebody fired a gun outside and I'll go see what it is. You see, it's not like in my early life, I was emotional over everything. Everything was an upheaval, not just in the home, because there was no structure like this that I'm telling you about. I think this is fantastic that you have the information. And if you apply it, he's saying always, then you will be happy. You will be calmer. It will work out for you better in the community. I don't know if you've been here before, but let me just show you what I mean, because we start retreats, we always use this one sutta, number 19, which is the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta. And you say, well, why do you use that sutta when you're starting a retreat? Because of the way it sounds in the beginning is so cool. It sounds like this, whoever this is in the story is one of my kids and they're going to go to the science fair see and they want to win a prize at the science fair in high school that's what this reminds me of so he says this is the the buddha and he's speaking to the monks and he's telling them something from before he was enlightened because before my enlightenment while i was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes, and then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty, and I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, that's loving kindness, and um, thoughts of non-cruelty, that's compassion. So as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. And I understood this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me, and it leads to my own affliction. 
to others afflictions to the affliction of both of us it obstructs wisdom causes difficulties and it leads me away from nibbana when i considered those things that how that worked it subsided in me because all of a sudden i saw it for what it was that's what this is about He's teaching a method for you to investigate everything I say, question everything I say. And I'm trying to show you if you test it, you will find out this stuff really works. And that's what's really fun. You know, when I see somebody really take it and do it exactly the way I'm telling them to do it, you can't mix the instructions up with anything else you did before. It's just like using the wrong flour or the wrong oil or the wrong something in a recipe and expecting to get the cake that you thought you were going to get. You're not going to get that cake. It won't work. Okay. So, and there's the sutta that talks about that also, the Vajikati Sutta, Vajikati on fire. Okay. So what he's telling you, if you do that with cruelty, with uh, loving kindness or with cruelty, I, you know, as soon as you identify this as an imperfection, meaning it's not working for me, people don't want to be around me, people don't want to work with me, they don't want to support me, it's failing. This is what they took to the science fair to see whether it would work. And the Buddha pointed out to them, you know, here's the thing you've got to remember. Whatever you frequently think and ponder upon in your mind, that will become the inclination of your mind. So you direct your mind. Do you see what all this is about? All this is about, I finally came to the realization that I'm teaching you how to communicate with your brain as if it's a little child inside you. You're, you're learning to communicate with it and you're learning how it works. And it's not the same as me just talking to you, but if you frequently think and ponder on ill will, things are not gonna work out with people or thoughts of cruelty or you cultivate that kind of thing, it's not gonna work. But if you're using loving kindness, forgiveness and uh, forgiveness, compassion and loving kindness, or you're, uh, you, you're just practicing the Brahma Viharas in the order that they're happening, then everything changes. You start to lighten up, let go. No thoughts of cruelty can arise in your mind. And this is a fact, you know, and, you know, it's not going to naturally, they're not going to pop up if you're going in that direction. So you see, he was teaching people how to communicate with their minds and reset after they have a certain set of knowledge going with the training of the meditation, parallel training. That's in his description of how he, he grades the process of his monks and how they were doing. We find out that he was grading them on the comprehension of the Dhamma and on the meditation, not just one thing, but two things. So gradually what Bhante Vimalaramsi figured out was there are, there are actually, um, there are these uh, eight topics that have to be, sometimes you look at them, you think there's only six, okay? But the first one is about the precepts, okay? And then, the second one is the hindrances. You have to understand what they are, how they operate in order to let them go and not have them bother you anymore. But you have to understand why I'm telling you to let go of them and leave them alone instead of fighting with them and treating them like an enemy. You have to understand you don't have to do anything in the meditation the Buddha was teaching to, to change you just need to allow. And that is contrary to a lot of teaching that's going on today. It's very different. And it actually frightens some people. What are you telling me? How could this whole thing be so simple? Well, he sent you a message about that. And if you're doing the puja or you're attending a puja, you hear it every time you go to a puja. You hear sanditiko, akaliko, eipasiko, opanaiko, pachitam, weditabo, winuiti. You hear that it was, an, what I'm teaching you is easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection, and it's untouched by time. You see? 
this all this stuff is really to me it's just really neat because it all fits together there's nothing contradictory in it if you're studying suttas for instance but you're studying them one at a time as if they are units of information and you're studying them just one at a time like that and you're not following through to practice what they were talking about and see it for yourself you're looking at them and saying well this one contradicts that one contradicts this one but if you're practicing and you're seeing this happen these things and you're learning them then you begin to see wait a second they're not contradicting each other you know they're actually uh, sort of like the cogs in a machine or the pieces that are inside a watch an old-fashioned watch that has all the little pieces inside before the time of the crystals <laughs> you know before the time when you you didn't have to wind it up but when you wind it up uh, uh when you wound up a clock you had all these little things inside that operated you see that's kind of like what the buddhist teaching is but you have to look at it and understand he's telling you here whatever you start thinking about that's going to be the inclination of your mind inclination means that that leans in a direction, a wholesome or an unwholesome direction. Now, what do I mean by wholesome and unwholesome direction? We keep breaking things down. I like to tell people I use the, you know, the, the, the ice cream cone like this. <laughs> the ice cream's up here on top, okay? And we go all the way down to the very bottom down here. What is wholesome or unwholesome for you? Tension and tightness that leads to uh, problems in headaches and conditions in your body, those are unwholesome. And just the slightest tension and tightness that's happening, that tension and tightness is craving and clinging. It's I like it, I want it mind. Or I don't like it, I don't want it, I want to make it stop. You see, and that's tension and tightness. I just been reading some theses this week because I couldn't work and I kept trying to just feed myself something and found out that there was a whole movement in the early times there was a whole movement after the buddha was gone in what's called the madhyamaka and that that group that school was talking about how all of this is empty of everything it's just empty and but there's no such thing as empty empty we that's another story <laughs> but but this emptiness is allowing yourself just to the emptiness, what they're saying, the emptiness actually referred to around the time that Nargajuna put his school together actually meant you are empty of taints, you are empty of defilements, you are empty, empty of everything. That's how the condition arises for you to fall into the Nirodha Samapati, the cessation. And it made perfect sense to me when I saw this. Now, there are other parts of that school that I could disagree with, but this one particular angle, I had never seen it written about so well, explaining the conditions that you reach in order to fall into cessation after going down the path gradually, and you get to that level. We, we talked to you about the conditions for the first jhana, conditions for the second, for the third, for the fourth. We teach you about infinite space, infinite consciousness, and nothingness, and neither perception or not perception. What we don't teach you about is I never thought about trying to encapsulate what it is the conditions are in order to fall over into Nirodha Samapati. But all this time, you know, students were coming to interviews and say, I have to get there, I've got to get there, I have to get Nibbana and all that stuff. And I was saying to them, back off, you know, let go of that, step away, move away, leave the building and then turn around and look and you'll just fall into it. That's what this is about leaving the and and today think about the world for a minute and what's out there with the competition between uh, any kind of business that you want to talk about tremendous corporate consciousness and competition and i have to climb the ladder and i'm young now and how far up the ladder can i get i'll tell you a secret <laughs> All of the dramas, all of the things that are mentally going on for the human being at the bottom of the ladder, 
is going on for the people on the top of the tower. No matter how rich they are, no matter what happens, no matter how many materialistic things they get in their life, they're facing the playing the same exact dramas that happen in every single movie that you ever saw from the bottom to the middle to the top demographically it's deniable you can't say it's any one thing you know it's uh, and they they a lot the biggest the, the most interesting story is a guy that you know gets it to the top he owns his own corporation he's successful as an entrepreneur he goes on and on and on and on and when he gets up there then there's nothing left and the wife has left the kids have grown up they're gone everything's gone that story is the phenomenal story for the guy at the very top there's nothing left so he goes and <laughs> he tries to marry somebody 19 years old and or 20 years old and that's fine when he's 60 or 55 or 60 years old but the only problem with that is you know they don't have any relationship about things to talk about at all <laughs> that's what they come from these completely different places and they can play that game but oh my gosh none of the dramas change that fascinates me when i counsel people It's going for this guy that's a billionaire. No Your voice was breaking. Uh, then so, you so uh, oh, I can't do anything because Punch's shield is down and I'm on Geo 3. Okay. It's back again. Is it back? It's okay. Yes, it is back. Okay, we'll just cross your fingers because Pontius Seal died. <laughs> We're gonna have a funeral later tonight. I take the thing outside and bury it. <laughs> okay, well, let's go on. I hope that answered your question in a roundabout way. I know I went all over the place in talking to you about that, but what I see happening sometimes um, when people ask questions, they want a, a cut and dry answer. And then Buddhism isn't like that because all of these subjects are tied together. I'll tell you the subjects really quickly when I said there's eight subjects. And I, I had some people who were who did a really nice job at the end of a retreat talking about this. And they said there were six. They didn't realize there were eight. So let's just see if we can show you where the eight are. So the, 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 um, the, um, the instructions for the, the retreat, for the practice, the, the correct instructions, straightening out all the words and the meanings so that they all fit together like that. That's the first part of this that has to happen. And then the second day when you're practicing is the hindrances. That is the second piece because no matter who you are, where you come from, or where you've been practicing before, hindrances are always going to be a problem for people in their meditation. So working out, the understanding clearly about the nature of the hindrance, how it operates, and how to handle it, to manage it, that's the second one. The third one is the path, not teaching you about the path. I've spoken to people who say, well, you should never talk about the path. You should never say anything to anybody because they'll come and they'll tell you they went down the path. And I said, so I, I've been through that where a student would come and lie to me, but I can figure out that they're lying after a little while. Just it's silly not to tell you, um, you know, what each one of those levels is about, because how will you know that you're experiencing it or not if you do not have the framework? So it's, it's kind of silly not to be telling you what is ha happening in each one of those levels. And we can tell almost right away, one or two interviews. And then we know right away, it's not real what you're selling us. If you, but we trust everybody to say the truth. We trust everybody to do this in earnest, but it doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> you want it to, but it's not, not always gonna happen that way. So the third one, the third one is the path, okay? The fourth one is going back into Satipatthana and taking a closer look at what it could have meant that's more precise. Because a lot of times Satipatthana is taught as the only way to Nibbana. And some people hear this as meaning we don't need any of those other 86,000 suttas at all. 
We don't need any other topics at all. We just need this one sutta and we can go all the way to Nibbana. And I, you know, I looked at that and looked at it and looked at it and read it and read it. And finally bells went off and said, well, it isn't false what you're saying that you need everything in Satipatthana. You need to understand it clearly, but we do understand it clearly the way we're training. And, um, but the point is that you can't seem to see where all these things fit clearly together to other things unless you have the other subject matters. So we had the instructions, we had the hindrances, hindrance management, third day was path knowledge, fourth day was um, reevaluating the uh, retuning, I like to say retuning slightly, retuning, like you're, you're fixing the, the string on a stringed instrument so it's tuned precisely in Satipatthana. And the next day is dependent origination. That's, that's the next one. So there we have the instructions, um, the, the, um, the hindrances, the path. We have the uh, Satipatthana. And the fifth day, we have the uh, dependent origination. And the sixth day, we have the um, um, Anatta teaching. And taking you through the Anatta teaching takes a lot of frustration away from you and a lot of doubt away from you and everything once you are trained with a particular sutta, listening to that sutta straightens a lot of things out about what he was doing and what he was talking about with that. And then the Eightfold Path, that is the seventh one that you have to have. And then the, um, the last one has to do with the subject matter that's in the questions and answers, those two suttas we try to get to you in the first or second time you go to retreat, because they're all the questions you wanted to ask, you, but you wanted to know, but you were afraid to ask. All the things that are happening in the training and everything and why you get blocked, all kinds of things. So there's really like eight, eight pieces, blocks of information, but they fit together just like this, just like that so perfectly uh, that everything works correctly and you don't struggle in your meditation. Okay, let's see what time. Go to the part two of our uh, this thing today. Yeah, I'm gonna go to part two. Okay, so part two, we're gonna go through this one. It's a little quicker. Qualities for success. And I don't know if I put this on, on the screen or not, because um, I've been in and out of here a couple times. And where is it? Uh, here we go. Is that it? Oh, yeah. Okay, so the qualities for successful and for in, in successful individuals. Now listen carefully to this. Wise and virtuous, gentle and eloquent, humble and amenable, such a person will attain success. Energetic and not lazy, unshaken by troubles, of good conduct and intelligent, such a person will attain success. Approachable and friendly, kind with words and unselfish, a teacher, guide, and leader, such a person will attain success. Now the qualities regarding the character of an individual come first, and morality is the foundation on which everything else rests upon. Thus, one has to be wise and virtuous to have true and long-lasting success. And this means that one uh, must not only be able to distinguish right from wrong, but to actually do what is right and avoid what is wrong. One should also be gentle and not harsh, not hurt others with words, and be humble and agreeable. Next come the essential qualities required for a successful working life. In earning a living or in business, no other quality can replace the readiness for hard work. Remaining steadfast, despite trouble or problems, maintaining one's integrity in times of difficulty are also being polite 
and well-mannered and keen to improve by learning new skills or methods are the other necessary qualities for success in business or at work. And finally, the individual should be open and friendly and not aloof or proud. He or she should speak kindly, lead by good example, be willing to share knowledge and experience with others, to lead others along the same path or accomplishment will bring complete and absolute access to any individual. So these are key things. Um, before I was a nun, I actually worked in human resources and placing people with companies uh, all over the US and mostly five or seven states specifically. But working with um, the business community, these things are perfect to be taught in a chamber of commerce or in a company or these qualities and the things they're talking about are exactly what the owners, the employers are looking for. Now the qualities of successful leader is the other topic that's under this. And this is where you're talking about leadership in countries, leadership in uh, world um, situations that are occurring, generosity, pleasant speech, being helpful to others, treating all with fairness at every place as each demands. These for winning ways hold the like the linchpin of a moving carriage. If these winning ways do not exist, then no mothers or fathers will receive honor and respect from their children. The wise reflect on these four winning ways. They therefore attain greatness and praise the praise that they deserve. For any society to be successful, it needs to have leaders and positive qualities. And these leaders, whether in government or in business, should be generous by nature, free from excessive greed. If not, they may succumb to corruption, embezzle the community's resources and steal from the public or from their own companies. Corruption, if unchecked, will definitely lead to the downward spiral of any society and eventually result in great hardships for the entire community. We can go back in history, we can look at this as exactly how it happens. Good leaders must be unselfish, compassionate, and willing to use the community's wealth and resources to help the needy and assist the underprivileged to improve themselves. In this way, society will develop the progress that it needs to reach higher levels. And leaders must be skillful in their use of speech and certainly not demean or humiliate anyone as this will breed hatred, resentment, and disharmony. Leaders must never abuse their positions and must observe the rule of law in all circumstances. Finally, they must emphasize fairness and equality for all regardless of wealth, religion, or race, or status. In short, leaders in society should be generous, pleasant, helpful, impartial, and with a desire to see everyone enjoy happiness and prosperity. These qualities hold society together without which it will deteriorate and decline. And if they do not have any of these qualities, society's leaders will not have the respect of the younger generation that will be the ones who succeed them. Leaders should realize the importance of these qualities and practice them. And will thus, the ones that do this, thus will attain greatness and fame and praise for they will lead their society to stability, prosperity, and success. 
And that is the end of this. So let's see. We are doing pretty well, I guess. We're 15 minutes over. <laughs> But we're constantly trying to have one hour talks and I'm still dreaming about them. I set myself up every night to dream about one hour talks. <laughs> and then I'm going to try half hour talks. Ah! <laughs> it can be done. It can. So does anybody have any questions about this? That's a sort of a, gee, it's a sort of a raw nerve topic because when we look at the world right now with what every what's happening in leadership around the world you can't really pin it on any one particular country i don't think um we're seeing a lot of problem with what we just described that's a short version <laughs> so does anybody have any questions about the, at this point Really? <laughs> no questions. You, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, well, more of a statement uh, as well as a question. But um, I mean, when you hear that, you certainly, um, you, could put your you could put yourself in a position where you'd recognize that to experience that would be a enormously beneficial. Uh, to have a leader or to have a, uh, someone who you work for uh, adopting those sorts of qualities. And yet, um, usually that they're in very short supply. And often um, organizations don't actually value um, the qualities that they represent. Um, uh, and so different qualities are, are espoused or seem to be um, of value. Um, and I certainly remember when I was working in business that uh, working in a cooperative way and working with a way which was open and um, uh, looking for a free flow of information. I mean, information flow in business is so difficult because information is power. And yeah. the idea that information should be freely available to those who need it um it was really deeply challenging uh i used to ask in, in organizations that i either went into or worked for in uh, only one question i'd go around and ask a very simple question which is what is it you need to do or what is it you need in order to do your work the way you would like to do it you'd wish to do it exactly and 95 percent of the time people would say I need this information, I need this knowledge, I need this understanding. Yeah, they usually uh, and, have an idea what and, they need. Yeah, and you know, and then you then you'd go to places where that information was being held, and you'd often have a well, they don't need to know that. If they want the answer to that, they need to come and see me. You know, because, what comes to you know, mind, there's this, this basic insecurity. yeah, what comes to mind is, um, what do they call it, where the planes go over and they dump the stuff in the skies, what's it called, I can't remember, and, and the whole thing is, well, first of all, they did that with the assumption nobody looks up, nobody walks around looking up at the sky. And, uh, you know, I, I followed that for a number of years. I mean, I, I don't, I just don't care anymore about this part. I, there's nothing I can do to make them stop doing whatever they want, but they, it all came out that what they were doing was um, basically attempting to change the planet and beat the, uh, the climate thing is what they claim, you know, beat it. But this idea of uh, believing that mother nature, uh, we know better than mother nature is very funny. You know, it's very funny to me because mother nature's done fine before we were even on the planet. And she took care of the planet from the beginning. And the fact that we're living in a period where this big shift is going on, it's not like it hasn't happened before. We saw the strafing and the lines in the, and I didn't believe it at first. And I remember Bonte showed me 
stuff in Nexus Magazine had it, but Nexus Magazine had it before anybody in mainstream was willing to talk about it. And over the years, we watched what happened very slowly. And then it became in regular scientific journals and scientific magazines and tested in hospitals and everything when they went up and caught the what was being dumped in the, in, in the sky. And then they talked about the weaving. And I I said, that's not real. That's got to be a lie. Weaving is where the planes are going across the sky this way, and the other planes are going across the sky this way. And then it, it comes as a stripes and stripes this way and stripes and stripes this way. And then it weaves very quickly and the blue sky is gone. And it's all gray and cloudy way up high in the stratosphere. There's no real light anymore. And I said, that's a lie. And we got in the car in Florida. I had to drive him to New York. And as we were going up the East Coast on 95, watching the sky, I pulled the, I pulled the car over and stopped and said, wake up, wake up. You've got to see this. It's real. They're really doing that. Now, no one could convince me after that this was a bunch of airline flights going this way and going this way at one time in the sky and crossing each other. Nobody could get me to deny that something funny wasn't going on. But the whole, the whole idea is so absurd to pretend that we could ever become Mother Nature without really hurting the planet, you know? This is craziness. And so uh, the... Um, yeah, but what you're saying is so true. I mean, it's all it's all true. Everything. Yeah. Is there anything else? Hmm? Now you're all frozen. Uh, no, that's that's good. I enjoyed the uh, yeah. We have these deviant ways of going over here and around there. <laughs> One of the things that I find interesting about Bonte's teaching is he came out. I think I was probably being taught for about nine years. And then he came, there were some things that happened at the center. Some storms came and, um, you know, he said, you can't really tell what your development is in, in um, practice and in Buddhism, unless you're watching your humor at the same time, you have to have a sense of humor about life. <laughs> I thought, how can that be that important, you know? And then one day we got in, I got in the truck, I hurt my back and we, I had to go to the chiropractor and, and we drove into town. And then when we got to town, I mean, I went into the chiropractor and laid down so he could move, adjust my back and uh, got a phone call and he gave me the phone and it was the center saying, you've got to come right back. We've been hit by a tornado. <laughs> thinking but I thought okay fine and I went out and told him and I couldn't really feel upset or frightened about this I just felt that that happened we got to get in the truck and go back we went back we pulled into the driveway we looked in the front yard and there had been 12 huge oak trees big big oak trees there were were no trees. They were gone. None of the buildings were damaged. Nobody can figure out why. None of the uh, the the uh, structures on the property at the bottom or the top of the hill, none of them were damaged. But only the trees were pulled out, and certain parts of certain equipment was in the in the trees that were left. <laughs> And then trees had fallen down along the road that had to be cut up. It was just like a lot of work. But we stood by the gate and um, I looked at the house. The one thing that was that part of it did get taken away was about two thirds of the old house just was gone. And I looked at the house and I was outside the gate and he looked and he looked at me and he wondered if I was okay. And he said, you okay? And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you see? I said, I see that we will not have to raise any money to tear down the house. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was great because we were trying to find the money to tear this down and put something else there. And so about two thirds of it was gone. And that's the funny thing is about this is not, we're not living in an area where this happens. And 
this was something that happened as a freak thing once after 71 years. Could happen any place, but it wasn't the terrain where this would normally happen. But just standing there and, and he started laughing and I started laughing. What is to say? What can you say when something like that happens and you look in and there's, that's about the only remark he say. It was there, it's gone now. We don't have to tear it down, that's it. No. And um, so your sense of humor to life, that was the point, the moment that I knew that he's talking about your sense of humor of anything happening in life. You have to look at it and say, instead of saying, why is this happening to me? You have to say, oh, look at this. Isn't it going to be fun? And we're going to get through it no matter what. And we went and helped some other people in another area that had it rougher than us at that time. So yeah, you do what's necessary and you keep smiling because whatever's arising is not there. It's there. It's coming along. And then it goes away. Afterwards, it passes away. So this is the origination and the disappearance of everything coming and going, coming, going. And after a while, you know, if you don't like the way things are, just wait a minute, wait a few minutes <laughs> and everything will change. Everything will change around. You're not stuck. And I thought in my earlier years, I always believed that I must stuck. I'm not stuck. Well, if I so are we ready? Your to, voice is breaking once again. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Any more questions? Discussion? Hmm? Yeah, uh, I think uh, we should end over here because uh, your screen kind of uh, 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 holds up and uh, your voice is also kind of breaking. So am I, here, not am I not... here now? Am I here with you now? Yes, yes, you are there. But uh, <laughs> it comes and goes. Uh, maybe because I think uh, you are also kind of uh, very tired. Maybe no, I'm fine. Can... <laughs> I'm fine now. I'm fine. Um, I don't know why it seems that I'm going in and out because it's funny you you freeze up and then I'm still here and I'm wondering where you are. Yeah, okay. yeah, because that works both ways no? for the internet. Uh, so, so as I told you, as I told anybody who was not here before, if you want the Sutta, uh, Sigilavada Sutta and the four different meetings, you let us know because we have that in a folder and we can send that to you. Okay. So yeah. um, let us uh, close the meeting now and, and then we'll come back next week and have some new stuff. Okay. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearlessly. May the grieving get all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May, May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.